Hi, everybody. Sorry, we're starting just a little bit late. Life got in the way. Hi, Littles. Uh, I'm going to wait just a little bit to let other people join in. Uh, excuse my little rambunctious baby girl. She's a little, wants to be wonder free. All right. I hope you have um, a loved one nearby you or sitting here watching your story. Also, make sure that you hold your special toy tight. This is Babar. This is Grace's. What's really special about Babar is it used to belong to her Uncle John. And Kaylee, do you have one? My, um, my, my, I need my driver zoom. Driver zoom. And did your Aunt Gail give you that? Yeah, my Aunt Gail gave me this. Do mm -hmm. you sleep with this every night? Yeah. Awesome. Play, and play. I actually have mine as well. Play. This is Gunny Bear. Wow. I've had Gunny Bear since I was a kid. And what's really special about Gunny Bear, he's just been loved on so much. And does Gunny Bear sleep with you too? Yeah. All right. Okay, everyone. So we'll start our story time. Our first story of the day is the Velveteen Rabbit. Some of us have heard of this. Some of us haven't. I hope you enjoy this sweet little story about love. And so the Velveteen Rabbit by Marjorie Williams, illustrated by Michael Hong. Uh -huh. <clears throat> the Velveteen Rabbit, or how toys become real. It's a beautiful illustration. All those toys that are in the nursery. There once was a velveteen rabbit, and in the beginning, he was really splendid. He was fat and bouncy as a rabbit could be. His coat was spotted brown and white. He had real red whiskers, and his ears were lined with pink sateen. <coughs> On breakfast morning, when he sat wedged <coughs> on top of the boy's stocking with a sprig of holly between his paws, the effect was quite charming. There were other things in the stocking, nuts and oranges, a toy engine, and chocolate almonds, and a clockwork mouse, yeah. but the rabbit yeah. was the best of all. For at least two hours, the boy loved him. See the velveteen rabbit sitting in that stocking? And again, I'm going to take Kaylee's advice and we're going to take the best jacket off. Okay, and then the aunts and uncles came to dinner and there was a great rustling of tissue paper and unwrapping of parcels. That means presents. And in the excitement of looking at all the new presents, the velveteen rabbit was forgotten. For a long time, he lived in the toy cupboard and on the nursery floor, no one thought much about him. He was naturally shy until and only made of velveteen. Some of the more expensive toys uh, quite snubbed him. The mechanical ones were very superior and looked down upon anyone and everyone else. They were full of modern ideas and pretended they were real. The model boat, who had lived through two seasons and lost most of his paint, caught tone from them and never missed an opportunity of referring to his rigging in technical terms. The rabbit could not claim to be a model of anything, for he didn't know what real rabbits, he did not know that real rabbits existed. He thought they were all stuffed with sawdust like himself. He understood that sawdust was quite out of date and should never be mentioned in modern circles. Even Timothy, the jointed wooden lion who was made by disabled soldiers, should have had broader views, but on airs pretended he was connected with the government. Between them, between them all, the poor little rabbit was made to feel himself very insignificant and commonplace. And the only person that was kind to him was the skin horse. See the little boy playing with the velveteen rabbit? He really does seem to love him for that little bit of time. Those other toys don't seem very kind, do they? But what do you think about the skin horse? Let's see. The skin horse lived longer in the nursery than any of the others. 
He was so old that his brown coat was bald in patches and showed at the seams underneath. And most of his hair on his tail had been pulled out to string bead necklaces. He was wise for he had seen a long succession of mechanical toys arrive to boast and swagger and by and by break their main strings and pass away. He knew that there were only toys and would never turn into anything else. For nursery magic is very strange and wonderful and only playthings that were old and wise and experienced like the skin horse understand about this. Do you think your toys are real? You don't think your toys are real? No. Do you think you make your toys real? You sure? Let's see. What's real? asked the rabbit one day when they were lying side by side near the nursery vendor. Before Nana came to tidy the room, <clears throat> does it mean having things buzz inside of you and stick out a stick out handle? Real isn't how you were made, said Skin Horse. It's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt us the rabbit? Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. When you're real, you don't mind being hurt. No, you really don't, do you? Does it happen all at once, like being wound up? Uh, the rabbit asked, ah. bit by bit. It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become, it takes a long time. That's why it doesn't often happen to people who break easily or have sharp edges or have been carefully kept. Generally, by the time you ah. are oh my goodness. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has fallen off. By the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off, and your eyes drop out and get loose at the joints and are very shabby. But these things don't matter at all, because once you're real, you can't be ugly, except to people who don't understand. <coughs> they like that a generalization, not just for toys, but also for people. Sometimes you don't understand what's on the surface, but if you're truly loved, you understand deep down. I suppose you're real, said the rabbit. And then he wished he had, had not said that, for he thought the skin horse might be sensitive, and the skin horse only smiled. Mm. Katie, do you want to sit? Oh, okay. The boy's uncle made me real, said the skin horse. That was a great many years ago. But once you're real, you cannot become unreal. It lasts always. The rabbit said he thought it would be a long time before the magic called real happened to him. He longed to become real, to know what it felt like. And yet the idea of growing shabby and losing his eyes and whiskers was rather sad. He wished that he could become it without being these uncomfortable things happening to him. I do too. Do you know what? Sometimes growing and being loved takes a little pieces out of us, but it also adds so much more. Look, look at all of those magical toys that are in the nursery. Some of them will just be toys forever, but others, I think some of them are going to be real. I'm not touching it. There was a person called Nana who ruled the nursery. Sometimes she took no notice of the playthings laying about, and sometimes for no reason whatsoever, she went swooping about and getting great men to hustle them all to the covers. She called this tidying up, and the playthings hated it. I'm sure my daughter's playthings hate that when I do it. That's your mommy's and daddy's do it too. Maybe even your grandparents. Um, the rabbit didn't mind mind it so much, for whatever he was thrown, he came down soft. One evening when the boy was going to bed, he couldn't find the chime dog that he always slept with him. Nana was in a hurry and it was too much trouble to hunt down for china dogs at bedtime. 
So she simply looked about her and seeing a toy in the cupboard door stood up and she made a swoop. Which toy do you think she swooped up to sleep with the boy? I have an idea, do you? Mm -mm. Here she said, take your old bunny. He'll do for you to sleep with. And she dragged the rabbit out by an ear and put him into the boy's arms. That night, for many nights before, after, the velveteen rabbit slept in the boy's bed. At first, he found it rather uncomfortable, for the boys hugged him too tight and sometimes rolled over on him. <laughs> Parents and caregivers, I know you know that feeling when your kids just all over So we feel the rabbit. <laughs> And sometimes she yeah. so far out of the pillow that the yeah. rabbit yeah. Yeah. scarcely yeah. breathed, yeah. Yeah. and she missed it too. Yeah. 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 Long yeah. See the little boy sleeping yeah. yeah. in the yeah. I hope you're enjoying these wonderful noises and my children <laughs> enjoying themselves. Missing some awesome things. <laughs> and you missed it too. Those long moonlight hours in the nursery when the house was silent and his cocks and his skin horse. But very soon, he grew to like sleeping with the boy. For the boy used to talk to him and make nice tunnels for him under the bedclothes that he said were burrows the real rabbits lived in. And they were splendid games together in whispers. When Nana had gone away to her supper and left the nightlight burning on the mantelpiece, it's a shock. For any of you want to know? When the boy dropped off, to, and the boy dropped off to sleep, the rabbit would snuggle down close to the little warm, <laughs> warm chin and dream with the boy's hand clasped around <laughs> around him all night long. And as time went on, the little rabbit was very happy. So happy that he never noticed how beautiful the beautiful velveteen fur was getting shabbier and shabbier. And his tail had become unsown. And all the pink had rubbed off his nose for the boy had kissed him. Fun fact, my gunny bear is just like that with a loose tail. Do you have a toy like that that you love so much? Um, I have a tail. Um, I, I know yours has a tail. Uh -huh. He has a tail. It's just he's been loved so much that it's a little loose. Would you like to sit so we can continue reading and everyone can hear? <laughs> Spring came and they were ha they had long days in the garden. For where the boy went, the rabbit went. Too. He had rides in the wheelbarrow on picnics on the grass. Lovely fairy hunts to build for him under the raspberry canes behind the flower boulder. And once when the boy was called away all of a sudden to go out to tea, the rabbit was left out in the lawn until long after dusk. And Nana had come to look for him with a candle because the boy couldn't go to sleep unless he was there. He was wet through with the dew and quite earthy from diving into the burrows the boys had, boy had made for him the flower bed. And Nana rumbled. So the little boy playing with his rabbit, having so much fun. Do you think that little boy believes that his velveteen rabbit is real? Yeah. I'm sure he didn't smell very good when he was sitting outside in the wet. I know I've left stuff outside. Have you left stuff outside before? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, grumbled, uh, Nana grumbled as she rubbed him off in the corner of her apron. You must, you must have your old bunny, she said. Fancy all this fuss for a toy. The boy sat in the bed and stretched out his arms. Get me my bunny, he said. You mustn't say that. He isn't a toy, he's real. And the little rabbit heard that, he was happy. For he knew that the skin horse had said was true at last. The nursery magic had happened to him. And he was a toy no longer. He was real. The boy himself had said it. That night, also too, he was too happy to sleep. So much love stirred inside of the little sawdust heart that it almost burst. And into the button eyes, there was, and into his button, 
boot button eyes, there was a leap that a long lost the followers, there came a look of wisdom and beauty, so that even Nana noticed it next morning, and she when she picked him up and said, I declare, if that old bunny hasn't got quite a knowing expression. See Nana, she's looking at the bunny, starting to really see that that bunny might be real after all. That was a wonderful summer. Okay. Get out of the way. That was a wonderful summer near the house where they lived in the wood. And in a long June evenings, the boy liked to go there after tea. He took the velveteen rabbit with him and, and before he wandered off to pick flowers or play in the brigades among the trees. He always made the rabbit a little nest somewhere along the bracken where he could be nice and cozy, for he was a kind-hearted little boy, and he liked the, rab the bunny to be comfortable. One evening, when the rabbit was laying there alone, watching the ants run to and fro in his velvet paws and grass, he saw two strange beings creep up of the tall bracken near him. What do you think those strange beings will be? I just want to show you. There's the little boy carrying his wonderful velveteen rabbit as they go out to play during their summer days. Again, what are these two things that the velveteen rabbit's going to see? Could they be real bunnies? You see the brown one and the black one. Then there's a velveteen rabbit looking very curious at these strange things. Because remember, he's never seen a real rabbit before. There were rabbits like himself, but quite furry and brand new. They, they must have been very well made, for their scenes didn't show. And they changed shape in a queer way that moved. Yes, Kaylee. Daddy, do you think those are going to be staying up there? We will move them in a little bit, and we're absolutely right. Do you think maybe we can read our stories, right? Okay, let's continue, okay? <clears throat> they must have been uh, very well made, for their scenes didn't show, and they changed shape in a queer way when they moved. One minute they were long and thin, the next minute fat and bunchy. Um, instead of all staying the same as he did, their feet were padded softly on the ground, and they crept quite close to him. Pointing their noses. While the rabbit stared hard to see where the clockwork stuck out, very new people who jumped generally had something to wind up them up. Okay. They stared at him and the little rabbit stared back, and all the time their nose twitched. Why don't you get up and play with us? one of them asked. I don't feel like it, said the rabbit. Well, he didn't want to explain that he had no clockwork. Oh, said the furry rabbit. It's as easy as anything, and he gave a big hop sideways and stood on his hand, uh, his hind legs. I don't believe you can, he said. I can, said the little rabbit. I can jump higher than anything. He met when the boy threw him. But of course, he didn't want to say so. Can you hop on your hind legs? asked the furry rabbit. Okay, the two real rabbits talking to the velveteen rabbit, showing them how they can move. Oh, maybe it's not so real after all, or it's a different kind of real. Let's see. That was a dreadful question, for the velveteen rabbit had no hind legs at all. The back of him was made into one piece, like a pincushion. He sat still on the bracken and hoped that the other rabbits wouldn't notice. I don't want to, he said again, but the wild rabbits have very sharp eyes. And this one stretched out his long neck to look. He hasn't got any hind legs, he called out. Fancy a rabbit without any hind legs. He began to laugh. I have, cried the little rabbit. I've got hind legs. I'm just sitting on them. Then stretch them out and show me, like this, the wild rabbit, said the wild rabbit. And he began to twirl around, like around the little rabbit until he got quite dizzy. I don't like dancing, he said. I'd rather sit still. But all the while he was longing to dance for the funny little 
tingling feeling, tingling feeling ran through him, and he felt like he would give the world to be able to jump like the rabbits did. The strange rabbit stopped dancing and came quite close. He was so close this time that his long whiskers brushed the velveteen rabbit's ears. He wrinkled his nose, suddenly flattened his ears, and jumped backwards. It doesn't smell right, he explained. He isn't a rabbit at all. He isn't real. I am real, said the little rabbit. I am real. The boy said so. Then he nearly began to cry. It's really sad, isn't it? Just then there was a sound of footsteps and the boy ran past near them. With a stamp of feet and a flash of white tails, the two strange rabbits disappeared. Come back and play with me, called the little rabbit. Oh, do come back. I know I'm real. But there were no answer. Only little ants ran to and fro and the bracken swayed gently where the two strangers had passed. The velveteen rabbit was all alone. Rabbit said they ran away from the velveteen rabbit. Sure would have been nice if they stayed to be friends. But sometimes things don't happen like that. Let's see what's going to happen with the velveteen rabbit. Oh dear, he thought, why did they run away like that? Why couldn't they stop and talk to me? For a long time, he lay very still, watching the bracken and hoping they would come back. But they never would come. Presently, the sun sank lower, and the little white moths floated by. The boy came and carried him home. Weeks passed, and the little rabbit grew very old and shabby, but the boy loved him so much. He loved him so hard that all his whiskers fell off, and the pink lining on his ears turned gray, and the brown spots faded. He began to lose his shape. He scarcely looked like a rabbit anymore, except to the boy. To him, he was always beautiful, and that was all the little rabbit cared about. He didn't mind how he looked to other people, because the nursery magic had made him real. And when you're real, shabbiness doesn't matter. No, well, it really doesn't. No matter what you feel like, as long as you're loved, you're the most beautiful thing in the world. And then, one day, the boy was ill. His face grew very flushed, and he talked in his sleep. And his little body was so hot that it burned the rabbit, and he was held close. Strange people came and went to the nursery, and a light burned all night for all the little velvet. And through it all, the little velveteen rabbit lay there, hidden from sight under the bedclothes. He never stirred, for he was afraid if they found him, no one, someone might take him, take him away, and he knew that the boy needed him. What? And he did. That one little comfort is the best thing in the world. It was a long, weary time. The boy was too near to feel to play, and the little rabbit found it rather dull with nothing to do all day long. Been there. I understand that. I'm sure you do too some days. But he struggled, snuggled down patiently, and looked forward to the time when the boy would be well again, and they would go to the garden amongst the flowers and the butterflies and play splendid games in the raspberry thicket like they used to. All sorts of delightful things he planned, and when the boy lay half asleep, he crept up in the pillow and whispered in his ear, and presently the feet returned, and the boy got better. He was able to sit up in the bed and look at pictures while the little rabbit cuddled close by his side. And then one day, they let him get dressed. Yep. He's able to read a book, and the bunny gets to snuggle real close to him. That must be an amazing comfort for both of them. The boy was going to Eastside tomorrow, and everything was arranged. And now the only thing that remained was to carry out the doctor's orders. They talked about it while the little rabbit lay under the bedpost with just his head peeping out and listened. I apologize for my little Lego. <laughs> the room was to be disinfected and all the books and toys that the boy had played with in the, in the bed must be burned. 
Oh no. <sighs> Hurrah, thought the rabbit. Tomorrow we shall be taken seaside, for the boy who often talked about the seaside and wanted very much to see the big waves coming in and the tiny crabs in the sandcastles. Just then Nana caught sight of the rabbit. How about his old bunny? She asked. That, said the doctor. Why, that's a mass of scarlet fever, Jones. Burn it at once. What nonsense. Get him a new one. He mustn't have that anymore. No. That poor bunny. But I guess it does make sense to get rid of some of his germs. And so the little rabbit was put on the stack with gold books and lots. A lot of rubbish and carried out to the end of the garden behind the bow house. It was a fine place to make a bonfire, only the garden was too busy to just attend it. She had a potato, he had potatoes to dig and green peas to gather, but next morning he promised to come quite early and burn up the whole lot. That night the boy slept in a different room and had a new bunny for him to sleep with. It was a splendid bunny, all white and plush, with real glass eyes. The boy was too excited to care very much about it. But tomorrow he was going to seaside. And that itself was a wonderful thing. If nothing else. And while the boy was asleep, dreaming of the seaside, the little rabbit lay among the old picture books in the corner of the fowl house. What oh, very lonely. The sack had been left untied, and so by wiggling a bit, he was able to get his hat out of the opening and look out. He was shivering a little, for he had not he had been used to sleeping in a proper bed, and by this time his coat had worn so thin and threadbare from hugging that there was no longer protection for him. Nearby, he could see a thicket of raspberry canes growing tall and close in the tropical jungle. And that shadow he had played with the boy on begone mornings. He thought of all the long sunlit garden hours in the garden, how happy they were. A great sadness came over him. He seemed to see them all pass before him each more beautiful than the other. The fairy huts in the flower bed, quiet evenings in the woods where he laid in the bracken, little ants that ran over his paths. Those wonderful times sound amazing. He got to spend with that boy. A wonderful day when he first knew that he was real. He thought of the skin horse, so wise and gentle, and all that he told him. For what use was it to be loved and lose one's beauty and become real. All ended like this. A tear, a real tear, trickled down of his little shabby velvet nose and fell on the ground. Then a strange thing happened. From that tear, from where that tear had fallen, fallen a flower grew from the ground. A mysterious flower, not at all like any that grew in the garden. It was a slender, had slender green, green leaves color of emeralds, and in the center of the leaves blossomed like a golden cup. It was so beautiful that the little rabbit forgot to cry and just lay there watching it. Presently, the blossom opened and out stepped a fairy. See that beautiful fairy? There's the yellow flower with like a golden cup that came from the rabbit's tear. And there's the rabbit. What do you think that fairy is gonna do? She was quite the loveliest fairy in the whole wide world. Her dress was pearl dewdrops and there were flowers around her neck. And in her hair and her face was like the most perfect flower of all. And she came close to the little rabbit and gathered him up in her arms and kissed his velveteen nose that was all damp and crying. Little rabbit, she said, don't you know who I am? The rabbit looked at her and it seemed to him that he had seen her face before, but he couldn't think where. I'm the nursery magic fairy, she said. I take care of all playthings that children have loved. When they're old and worn out and the children don't need them anymore, then I come and take them away with me and turn them real. Wasn't I real before? said the little rabbit. You were real to the boy, the fairy said, because he loved you. Now, 
You shall be real to everyone. She held the little rabbit close in her arms and flew into the woods. It was light now, for the moon had risen. All the forest was beautiful, and the fort fjords of the bracken stone, like frosted silver. In the open glade behind the tree trunks, wild rabbits danced with their shadows in the velvet grass. When they saw the fairy, they all stopped dancing and stood around her ring to stare at her. I brought you a fellow playmate. Playfellow, the very fairy said. Fairy again, flying off with the velveteen rabbit to see his new rabbit friends and to become real. Oh, look at that wondrous sight of all of those rabbits dancing in the moonlight. See the velveteen rabbit with the fairy? Oh, that must be the most amazing thing to experience. You must be very kind to him and to teach him all he needs to know in rabbit land, for he's going to live with you forever and ever. And she kissed the little rabbit again and put it down on the grass. Run and play, little rabbit, she said. But the little rabbit sat quite still for a moment. He never moved. For when he saw the wild rabbits dancing around him, he suddenly remembered about his hind legs. He didn't want them to see that it was, it was all made in one piece. He didn't know that when the fairy kissed him that last time, she changed him altogether. Now he might might have sat there a long time, too shy to move, if just then something hadn't tickled his nose. And before he thought about it, he lifted his hind leg to scratch it. He found that he actually had hind legs. Instead of the dingy velveteen, his brown fur was soft and shiny. His ears twitched by themselves, and his whiskers were so long that they brushed the grass. He gave one leap and and the joy of using those hind legs was so great that he was springing just to truck around them, jumping sideways and whirling around as the others did. They were so excited that when at last we did stop to look for the fairy, she was gone. He was a real rabbit at last, at home with the other rabbits. A home with the other rabbits? Yeah. Autumn passed, and winter, and in the spring. The days grew warm and sunny, and the boy went out to play in the woods behind the house. And while he was playing, two rabbits crept out of the bracken and peeped at him. One of them was brown all over. The other had strange markings under his fur, as though long ago they had been spotted, and the spots still showed through. And about him a small nose and his round black eyes there was something familiar. So the boy thought to himself, why, he looks like my old bunny that I had lost when I had scarlet fever. But he never knew it really was his own bunny. Come back to look at the child who had first helped him be real. And the boy seen his real rabbit friend. Even though something's not there with you anymore, doesn't mean it doesn't still love you. We'll always love you. Such a kind story. I hope you have a toy like that. Made real. Give it a real big, big squeeze if you can. And tell it that you love it. You always will. Alright, okay. So Kaylee's handing me the next book. Uh, we're going to read The Legend of the Blue Bonnet, an old tale of Texas retold and illustrated by Tommy DeVono. Now, for some of you who don't know, Texas, or the Blue Bonnet is the uh, state flower of Texas where I'm from. What state are you from and what flower do you have? I know that we, uh, I'm right now in California and that's the golden poppy. Do you think maybe you could find out what your state flower it is and color it. I'd love to see some pictures. All right. Great spirits, the land is dying. Your people are dying too. A long line of dancers sing. Tell us what we have done to anger you. 
in this drought. Save your people. Tell us what we must do to send the rain that will bring back life. Save people as they are asking the universe and the spirits that they can do. For three days, the dancers danced to the sound of the drums. And for three days, the people called Comanche watched and waited. And even though the hard winter was over, no healing rains came. Drought and famine was hardest on the very young and very old. Among the few children left was a small girl named She who was alone. She sat, sat by herself and watched the dancers in her lap, a doll made of buckskin, a warrior doll. The eyes, nose, and mouth were all painted with the juices of a berry and wore long beaded leggings and a belt of polished bone. Its head was a brilliant blue feathers from the bird who cries, J, J, J. She loved the doll very much. See the little girl who she who is alone? And there's her warrior doll. What bird do you think those flowers are made out of those feathers are made of? I think it's a blue jay. Soon she who is alone said to her doll, the shaman will go off along the top of the hill and to listen to the words of the great spirit. And we will know what to do so that once more the rains will come and the earth will be free and alive. The buffalo will be plentiful and the people will be rich again. As she asked, as she talked, she thought of her mother who had made her doll, her father who had brought the blue feathers. She thought of her great, her grandfather and the grandmother she had never known. They were all like shadows. It seemed long ago that they had died from the famine. The people had named her and cared for her. The warrior doll was the only thing they left for the distant days. The girl, if she holds onto that doll and remembering her loved ones that have long passed that are still with her. The sun is setting, the runner called as he ran through the camp. The shaman is returning and the people gathered a circle of the shaman spoke. I have heard the words of the great spirits, he said. The people have become selfish. For years they have taken from the earth without giving anything back. The great spirit said that people must sacrifice. They must make a burnt offering of the most valued possession among us. The ashes of this offering will be scattered to the four points of the earth. The home of the winds and the sacrifices made. The drought and famine will cease. Life will be restored to the earth and to the people. So the people circle up and listen to the shaman's words. I, I hope they'll listen, but we'll see. The people sang a song of thanks to the great spirits for telling them what they must do. I'm sure it's not many go that the great spirit wants, a warrior said. Or my special blanket, a woman added, as everyone went to their teepees to talk and think over what the great spirits had asked. There's the teepees that they stay in. There's the bow and the blanket that some of these people might be not willing to part with, even though it would help. Everyone, everyone that is, except she who is. She held her doll tightly to her heart. You, she said, looking at her doll, are my most valued possession. It is you the great spirits want, and she knew what she must do. As the cancel fire, cancel fire died out, the teepee's flaps began to close. The small girl returned to the teepee where she slept to wait. The little girl all alone, holding her most prized possession. Do you think she's going to give it up so she can save her people? The night outside was still, except for the distant sound of the 
night bird with red wings. Soon, everyone in the teepee was asleep, except she who was alone. Under the ashes of the teepee fire, one stick still flowed. She took it and quietly crept into the night. And she goes out. She has her little warrior ball with her as she goes out into the night. She ran to a place on the hill where the great spirits had spoken to the shaman. Stars filled the sky. There was no moon. Oh, great spirit, she who was alone said, here is my warrior doll. It's the only thing I have from my family who has died in this famine. It is my most valued possession. Please accept it. See, she is alone with giving her most prized possession for what has been asked for the great spirits. Then gathering twigs, she started a fire with a glowing fire stick. The girl watched as the twigs began to catch and burn. She thought of her grandmother and her grandfather, her mother and father, and all the people who were suffering. They're hungry. And before she could change her mind, she thrust the doll into the fire. She's making her ultimate sacrifice to make sure that her people are okay. That's her most prized possession, and she knows that's all that she can give so she can save them. That takes a lot of heart. Most of them wouldn't be willing to do that. It's pretty amazing that she's able to. She watched until the fires died down and the ashes had grown cold, then scooped a handful. She, who is alone, scattered the ashes to the home of the winds, the north and the east, the south and the west. And there she fell asleep until the first light of the morning woke her. She said so as a <coughs> of her most prized possession. She looked out over the hill and stretched out from all sides. Where the ashes had fallen, the ground had covered to the flowers, beautiful flowers, as blue as the feathers of the doll and the hair of the doll as blue as the feathers of the bird who calls J, J, J. See? Were those ashes of her warrior doll that she gave so her people would be safe? Spread out flowers. These are blue bonnets. When the people came out of the teepees, their eyes could scarcely believe it. They gathered on the hill with she who was alone and looked at the miraculous sight. There was no doubt about it. The flowers were a sign of forgiveness from the great spirits. And as the people sang and danced, they gave thanks to the great spirits, and a warm rain began to fall. The land began to live again. From that day on, the little girl was known by another name, one who dearly loved her people. See, because that prized possession was given, the rains were able to come back, so that was what was asked. A great sacrifice was given for a reward to save her people. And every spring, the great spirits remember the sacrifice of the little girl and fill the hills and valleys of the land called Texas with beautiful blue flowers, even to this very day. If you've never seen blue bonnets in the spring, you should. And for all of you that I know that have been, I would love to see your blue bonnet in wildflower pictures. Because this is a truly miraculous sight. It comes from great love and a wonderful reminder. All right. All right, our last book for story time before we finish up is I Love You More by Christy Stalder and illustrated by Julie Edwards. I have a wonderful thing to say about this book. Yesterday was my mother's birthday. And unfortunately, for some of the events, I wasn't able to see my mom. She wasn't able to be here. Um, but what's great about this book, and it made me smile, and why I chose it for y'all today, is every time I say I love you to my mother, she always tells me, 
I love you more. And I began to realize as I became a mom, and I don't know if you've thought about this when you were, as you were a parent, my mom does love me more because she's just that wondrous thing. And I wanted to dedicate this to her. Also, while you're looking through this book and I show you these illustrations, these are from my friend, Julie Edwards. Please check out her artistry. They're absolutely magnificent and magical. I hope you enjoyed this book. All right, let's go. I love you more than a honeybee loves a jar full of honey. I love you more than a clover patch loves playful little bunnies. I love you more than a deer loves to nibble during juniper leaves. I love you more than a willow tree loves songbirds and canaries. See the little deer? Oh, and those beautiful little songbirds and canaries. I love you more than the twinkling stars love to sparkle at night. Isn't that magical? I love you more than the moon loves to gleam and shine so bright. I love you more than ladybugs love aspen trees. Can you count how many ladybugs? Have you spotted a ladybug lately? I love you more than the blossoms love to float on the summer breeze. I love you more than raindrops love dancing in a storm. I love you more than field mice love to cuddle and stay warm. I love you more than rainbows love a baby blue sky. Oh, it's pretty magnificent rainbow. Have you seen any rainbows lately? Or have you drawn any? Show me some pictures sometime. I love you, I love you more than butterflies love to flutter in gardens nearby. Or have you seen a butterfly fluttering? Have you said hi? I love you more than a moose loves giant water lilies. I love you more than squirrels love Red, ripe strawberries. I love you more than foxes love to frolic in the meadow. I love you more than a hedgehog loves to sleep. In the grotto. Can you find a little hedgehog sleeping in the grotto? Oh, there it is. I love you more than yesterday and what tomorrow will bring. I simply love I simply love you more, my dear. Hi. Yeah, heart. All snuggled up. more than everything. The end. I hope you've enjoyed this story time. I know it's been a little loud at some points, but life happens and that's what makes it beautiful and wonderful. Um, I hope that you have your loved ones nearby so that you can hold and squeeze and just tell them that you love them. 
Mama? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, tomorrow's Easter, so no matter how much you sell, how you celebrate it, just remember that it's a time of rebirth and learning, and to be shared with the ones you love. I hope, beyond hope, that we will continue with our love and kindness. Mama, can you tell me something? Hold on, yeah, in just a minute, and that we'll always be there for each other. Now, what would you like to say? Um, it's kind of cool to say, but I was wondering what we're going to do this song. Oh, I'm so glad. You can wear your dress outside, too. Oh, I could. Now, I'm going to go outside and play with my littles. I hope to see some wonderful pictures of flowers or pictures of even your favorite stuffed animal. And just remember you're loved. You might not hear it sometimes, but you are truly and honestly loved. I'll see y'all next Saturday. <laughs>